Welcome and thank you for joining me today to discuss indoor air quality. I'm Rob Ambrosetti with KGG Consulting and I'm happy to be your instructor today. You are currently in listen-only mode but have the opportunity to ask questions using the chat box in the control panel. You can ask questions at any time and I'll gladly answer them at the end of the session. So let's get started. So today's session is actually part one of a three-part series. This is a more of an introduction to indoor air quality. Uh, we'll discuss uh, definition of indoor air quality and basically what I call IAQ basic training. The second and third parts, second part being air purification technologies, we'll discuss what you might find out on the market today to help keep the air clean inside our uh, workspaces and living spaces. And lastly, you take from what you learn in parts one and two, and we help you to approach homeowners or contractor customers and help them sell what they've learned and in and, and helping people breathe better. Uh, to register for the other two parts, uh, you can go to kggconsulting.com forward slash events, and we'll have our active training calendar on there, which will bring you to registration pages for each of those. Today's session, if you happen to have a NATE certification, will earn you one hour of continuing education credit. So just make sure I have your NATE number. There's also a handout for today, uh, basically a cliff notes or cheat sheet, if you will, of today's uh, presentation. So after we're done and we part ways today, you'll have some notes uh, to take away with you and you can make your own notes, of course, on top of that. So a little agenda for today, we're gonna to discuss air, air pollution in the US um, and how it actually ties into what we're breathing on our indoor spaces. Uh, we're gonna talk about who's affected by poor air quality. Uh, we're gonna identify the major contaminants that we come across in our breathing space and then sources of those contaminants. We're gonna take a look at and define what we think ideal air should be and then the treatment strategies for the above contaminants and uh, ways to take care of and remediate those issues in the air. And then finally, identifying issues in the home. So according to the EPA, last year alone, or two years ago in the US, there was about 76 million tons of pollution emitted just in our atmosphere alone above the US. These emissions contribute to the formation of ozone and particles, acids, and, and of course, create visibility impairment, what we might know as smog. Air pollution, pesticides, and radon all contribute to the outdoor air quality, but really those elements outside affect, directly have an effect on what we're breathing on our indoor air. So it's a sad fact, but all of us as human beings, we spend roughly 90% of our time indoors. Um, and then if you factor in the time that we might spend in automobiles, uh, a lot of sales guys being in cars all the time, or you know technicians in the trade and service vans, that might actually end up being somewhere uh, near 93%. So as much as I like hiking, uh, the sad part is we spend about 90% uh, of our lives inside. The EPA actually has done studies in years past, and what they found is because of our homes and buildings getting tighter and less air exchange naturally occurring, we find that the air can be two to five times higher, the pollutant levels can be two to five times higher than what we actually see outside. In some cases, it could be even 100 times more polluted than what we experience outside as well. So some rough numbers here, there's a roughly about uh, 50 million people affected with allergic disorders. That actually ranks sixth leading cause of chronic illnesses in the United States. There's another 11 million people uh, that suffer from asthma and some of those asthma attacks are actually provoked by airborne pathogens. You know, uh, it could be pollen, it could be, you know, dust or uh, something to do with dust mites. But anyway, uh, you'll find that some asthmatics actually will get asthma attacks from those airborne uh, uh, contaminants. So who are these targeted groups? Again, anybody with allergy or, or allergies or asthma, people with respiratory disease, you probably have seen the commercials on TV for uh, uh, co companies that are advertising uh, for uh, treatments for COPD, uh, medicines for COPD, which is chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, which includes emphysema and uh, chronic bronchitis. Um, 
another sad thing, uh, but true, uh, people who are going through some sort of chemotherapy or radiation therapy, their immune systems uh, get uh, more compromised than the average uh, person. So uh, there's a need to keep the air a little cleaner around them when they're going through those treatments. And then con contact lens wearers, I just threw that in there because whenever uh, I used to wear contacts uh, and allergy season rolled around, I could tell you, I could let you know actually when uh, it was allergy season because I wanted to scratch my eyeballs out of my head. Basically, if it's not you, you probably know some somebody that have um, that's in these targeted groups and uh, primarily they're probably your, some of them are your customers uh, the good news is uh, you have solutions for them and, and that's of course probably why we're here today talking about it I call this the growth slide because it kind of gets your attention a little bit as to what we are naturally breathing in and around us. Uh, we do uh, uh, breathe about 3,000 gallons of air each day as breathing human beings uh, 250,000 dust mite fecal pellets can be in a half teaspoon of dust. So remember that the last next time you're going to go empty out the vacuum canister. Uh, I typically do mine outside out near the garage and keep my mouth and nose away from uh, the dust that comes out of that, dumping that. 10% um, of the entire population is allergic to cat or dog dander. And dander is just a fancy word for dead skin cell. Just think of the word dandruff. Unfortunately, us as humans, we are the worst offenders. We shed up to about 600,000 skin particles every hour. So yeah, when you go to empty out that vacuum canister, uh, you're actually in there, as disgusting as that sounds. So really, what are we saying here? Airborne contamination is considerable because of the amount of time we spend inside. You know, again, our buildings and homes have gotten tighter and more efficient with insulation. The downside is uh, with that, you, you know, in our heating and cooling seasons, you know, our windows and doors are closed longer and our exposure to that contamination uh, goes up. Us as heating and air conditioning professionals really need to ensure that the mechanical system is not the source of any contaminants, first and foremost, and then offer your uh, customers, you know, um, maintenance programs to keep everything clean as well. But really what we're talking about is putting yourself in a position to offer your customer solutions, right? And take this away and remember this particular quote, and this is really true, the only air we can control is the air we breathe in our home. That is the bottom line. So what is it we're actually talking about when we say, you know, uh, indoor air quality and what it is we're after? If we're going to try to help the air get cleaner, what is it we're after and actually after? So the Center for Disease Control, the CDC, actually categorizes them into three different categories. Don't get hung up on the percentages. Just think of them in terms of almost equal, equal thirds. Uh, and just remember, your lungs are you know, that they're your air filters. So whatever's in the air, it goes into your lungs. And uh, just remember, you have potential for getting whatever ends up in your lungs into your bloodstream. So the three major things we're concerned about are, first of all, germs. These are the microbes or the living organisms like bacteria and viruses, okay, funguses, mold. Um, second would be gases, uh, such as volatile organic compounds. And when you see VOCs, think in terms of like varnishes or off-gassing of materials like new carpet smell, new car smell. Uh, these are actually toxins, okay? As long as you might love the, the smell of new car smell, but it's actually a toxin. The worst ones are the ones you can't smell but get in your bloodstream, like formaldehydes. Um, Particulates. This is where the allergy sufferers of the world tend to live because we're talking about pollens, uh, animal dander, dust mites, and smoke. Uh, airborne particles we don't necessarily see. In fact, we don't see most of them, but we're sitting here breathing them right now as we speak. Uh, sometimes if the sun shines through the window, you can it'll highlight some of those. Uh, but again, these are dangerous because you can cause allergic reactions and or sickness, okay? So once you understand these three categories, you'll have a better understanding uh, when you go to look at all the different devices out in the market and ways to treat, you know, IAQ or indoor air quality, um, what their capabilities are. Some devices do a great job on germs, but don't do anything for particulates, and that brings up a good point. So you, you want to match a device to what the people in, inside the inside the home are experiencing. So if somebody has asthma or allergies to pollens, you want to find a device that actually handles particulates. Some will do a good job on both gases and, and germs, but nothing for particulates. Some do really well at particulates, but don't do much for germs and odors. So just remember germs, gases, and particulates, or germs, odors, and particulates, GOP. So what are some of the sources of these contaminants? 
primarily human activities, like you said, living and breathing. We inhale, exhale, we shed, uh, unfortunately. Uh, products for household cleaning and maintenance. There's uh, hypersensitive folks out there that can't even keep uh, cleaning um, agents or detergents in their house. They have to keep them outside or in a shed. Uh, personal care or hobbies, think of hairsprays, you know, glue from models or spray paint from hobbies, whatever it might be. Excess moisture. We're going to come back and talk about moisture because this is going to be really important. Uh, you know, we talk about humidity a lot in terms of comfort, but there's also a health side to humidity as well. Fuel burning uh, combustion appliances, uh, keep those in mind because you're talking about anything that has to do with burning of a fuel or even cooking. Tobacco products, of course. Building materials and furnishings, flooring, carpet, and upholstery. Again, off-gassing of VOCs, you know, that new carpet smell or new car smell. And then there's uh, different kinds of woods out there, uh, pressed woods that can off-gas uh, dangerous toxins as well. Again, uh, other sources, uh, we mentioned cooking, so whether it's stovetop, broil, bake, uh, that Thanksgiving Day turkey that you smell actually is off-gassing, you know, you're creating combustion, you're burning, you're burning meat basically and greases and that you give off particles basically in the air. Uh, I put the garage on there just because, you know, we can't forget about carbon monoxide, of course, that odorless uh, gas um, that you don't want to have a running car obviously in a gar garage and then obviously carbon monoxide getting to the house which brings up another good point about pressurization of a house if a house is under a slightly negative pressure and you have an attached garage i would want to remedy to that right away because you don't want anything getting uh, pulled into the your breathing space from the garage you'd actually want a slight positive fireplaces whether they're wood burning or gas uh, just remember this is combustion Anything that has to do with combustion, you know, there's going to be a byproduct there, carbon dioxide, and then particles given off from that combustion uh, over the course of the burning period. And again, there's all kinds of cleaners and detergents out there on the shelf. Uh, there are VOCs, volatile organic compounds that you might have a reaction to, or to, you're actually putting, by opening the container, put toxins in the air uh, that you're going to in, ingest. Um, hairsprays, carpeting, pressed wood and varnishes, they're all sources of VOCs or uh, pollution. Your pets, of course, cats, dogs, dander, um, and then of course on the bottom there, a lovely picture of the dust mite and what they leave behind. Those are actually dust mite fecal pellets. And if you're allergic to dust mites, it's actually the dead dust mites and the fecal pellets that they leave behind that we're, we're getting allergic reactions to. You know, great, great stuff, isn't it? Uh, under a microscope, this is what pollen would look like, fungal, some sort of fungal spore, different bacteria and viruses under a microscope. The thing here is, you know, the average or the common cold can live on an inanimate object for about a week. So everything we touch, think in terms of, and I'm not trying to create germaphobes here, but, you know, keyboards, phones, remote controls, doorknobs, uh, somebody that has a, has a virus can actually transmit that as we go and touch something behind them. I think the flu virus, in fact, can live up to about 24 hours to 48 hours, somewhere in there after we touch a surface. And then, of course, mainstream and side stream smoke, which is firsthand, secondhand smoke. Smoke is actually two things. It's a gas and it has particulates. So symptoms, you probably are aware of these, and it kind of sounds like a commercial, but headache, fatigue, shortness of breath, sinus congestion, eye, nose, and throat irritation, sneezing, coughing, dizziness, nausea, and skin irritation. There's actually people with allergies in the wintertime uh, that might have these symptoms, and you might think that someone might have a cold, uh, but these are similar symptoms to a cold, uh, of course, and uh, but it might just be a, an allergic reaction. So really important slide here. Uh, we're going to talk about humidity a little bit, but what if we were if we were to uh, identify what optimum indoor air would be? You know, ASHRAE actually ASHRAE tells us that in the winter time it's 68 to 74 degrees. In the summertime, 73 to 79 degrees is what is optimum. Of course, given that the relative humidity is between 40 and 60 percent, and this is where traditionally our trade uh, you know talks about humidity in terms of comfort, right? So as long as you're in that 40 to 60 percent range, you're going to feel comfortable comfortable, right? Uh, but from a health standpoint, if you look over to the right at this table here, um, you'll actually see that, you know, we all know what happens when the humidity goes high, things like tend to grow, right? Especially in dark places, when the humidity level is high, these uh, bacteria and viruses love high humidity, right? They thrive in it. 
On the other hand though, look at what happens when the air dries out. They thrive in dry air as well, below 40%. Okay, and look at where respiratory infections uh, tend to occur here in low humidity as well, especially with allergic rhinitis and asthma. Think of when cold season and flu season actually is. It's in the winter months, right? So what's actually happening? A lot for us, especially up in the northern hemisphere, um, tend to, uh, or up north in our northern climates where we're running heating systems, as we run our heating systems, you know, the relative humidity as we're running furnaces or air handling, any, anything heat related, we tend to drive the humidity down. So the conversation becomes a health conversation. So in the heating months up north in the northern climates, you tend to want to have humidifiers to help keep that humidity in this range. Vice versa, down in the southern climates, you're going to be talking about keeping the humidity knocked down. In the air conditioning season, you can have high relative humidity days outside. Think of like a 72 degree day outside, but it's, you know, 100% relative humidity where it's raining out. You're going to feel sticky and clammy on the inside. I guess also, you know, you're also letting things grow as well when you get up there. So think in terms of health when you're talking about humidity. Carbon monoxide, I threw that on there. Obviously, you want zero parts per million. It's a deadly, you know, uh, odorless gas. You can't see it. And we need all need carbon monoxide detectors, as you know, in our homes. Carbon dioxide, I threw that on there because there was a way to measure it. And think of commercial spaces, you know, cubicles and office spaces. People tend to get a little more lethargic and lazy after lunch, right? Not just because they might have had a big lunch, but it's because of the virtue or by the fact that, you know, all these people are breathing and consuming oxygen throughout the day. And then the CO2 levels, as we exhale, we're giving off CO2. The CO2 levels go up throughout the day. So if you had a rooftop package system with an economizer on it, uh, that would be a way to get fresh air into the space and basically start bringing it down. And I really just wanted you to know that it's about 750 parts per million that is a, a threshold where you don't want to go above that and people start getting a little, uh, are affected uh, at their desk because of the high carbon dioxide. Chemical pollutants and particle allergens, so VOCs and particulates, there is a, a threshold there too in which you want those to be down below. And in the cases of VOCs, less than 330 parts per billion and for particles less than 10 micrograms per cubic meter. There are devices on the market that you can use to measure these. Um, more, they're becoming more prevalent in our, in our stage today in this trade. Um, there is the, a couple different devices you can go on uh, Amazon or on the internet too and see, see what's out there. But uh, there is ways to measure that, and that's all I wanted you to know. So really, as HVAC professionals, you know what we're trying to say is we can help somebody achieve optimum indoor air when you start looking at all these variables okay you can help your customers as far as treatment strategies go source control first and foremost if there's any water issues in the home or building you have to address the water issues right if there's a leak in the roof or in flashing somewhere um, you have to address that water leak otherwise it's just a perpetual problem right if you don't fix the leak you're always going to have some sort of issue think in terms of you know the trash, when the trash smells, what do you do? You gotta take it out, right? Or even the kitty litter. Stinky kitty litter, you gotta change the kitty litter out. Temperature control, this is the world we live in, right? Hot and cold, turn the thermostat up or down to make us feel comfortable, it's sensible heat. And again, don't overlook humidity and what we call latent heat, right? So air conditionings by nature, air conditioning systems by nature are designed to take care of sensible heat. In a roundabout way, they do take care of humidity somewhat, but they're not meant to totally take care of all the moisture that might be in the air. So think in terms of humidifiers and dehumidifiers. Up north, when we're like we said before, when we're running the heating systems, we're drying the air out. We need to keep the we need to inject humidity at some point to keep the humidity level up at least to 40 percent in that 40 to 60 percent range. And the flip side is you know when you're in a high humidity area maybe through the summer months, you need to knock down the uh, humidity below 60% and uh, get the humidity down. So from a health standpoint, humidity is really important. Air dilution, by far and away, this is probably the first and foremost way to treat um, you know, stale indoor air, if you will, right? From, from In order to keep the pollutants down, if you can inject fresh air into the space, that's the way to do it. So normally you would say open the windows, right? But if it's 95 degrees out or zero degrees out, you're not gonna leave the windows open that long. You're not, you, you just won't be able to, you're gonna be uncomfortable, you're gonna be cold or hot, right? But you still need fresh air. So this is where we talk about you know, commercially as economizers, there's codes for those. And then residentially, there's energy recovery ventilators and 
heat recovery ventilators for residential equipment. These are air exchangers and by way of bringing fresh air in and exhausting stale air out, this is the way to go. In some states, actually in Canada, it's code for new construction. I think in some parts of Minnesota and Wisconsin, the same thing. And I think California is on its way to having those uh, as, as part of code, residential new building construction code as well. Um, problem here is they're not the cheapest things in the world to install, but they are the best way to keep uh, pollutants down in a space. The next line of defense would be air filtration. These are your air filters. Everybody, I think, knows what a throwaway air filter is, especially the one-inch size. Uh, so when talking to uh, homeowners uh, about um, allergies and what they might be going through, the first line of defense and the most affordable probably is a step up in the air filter. Uh, you might want to get away from the one-inch air filter, of course, and go to some sort of media air cleaner. I would say at the minimum, like a MERV 11 would help out uh, and help getting those particle particles knocked down uh, in the in the space. HEPA air filters, the way I explain this to homeowners would be like hospital grade air filters. Uh, you don't have to get into the nitty gritty and science of HEPA, but HEPA, because of the high restriction, you're gonna have, they usually those systems have their own internal blower that you let run constantly to get through the media, the HEPA filter media, but they do an excellent job at getting particulates out of the air and some some germs as well. Okay, and then finally, air purification devices. So if you actually wanna treat, treat the air in the space and help clean it up, you're, there's all kinds of devices out there on the market. What I would say is take a look at the three contaminants again when you're looking at different devices and remember your germs, your gases and your odors and your particulates and what is that device actually gonna help you with and match it, you have to match the device to what's going on in the home or with the homeowner, okay? In addition to remembering the three contaminants and what might be treated, I want you also to think in terms of passive and active devices. Okay, a passive type of, of filtration device or would be an air filter. So an air filter would be sitting there in the airstream ready to catch anything that happens to come its way. It's doing it passively. Think of the term or the analogy of a bug zapper. A bug zapper is in your yard, you turn the light on, it doesn't necessarily kill all the bugs in your yard, just the ones, the dumb ones that happen to fly towards the light and get zapped. So think in terms of active and passive. Active devices, uh, would actually proactively use the air distribution system to take and, and, and throw out uh, friendly air scrubbers or ions to go and clean out, out the air proactively. And uh, some of the really good ones will actually take and, and knock down all three contaminants and not just in the breathing air, but on surfaces as well. And that's important because remember how, how germs are transmitted on surfaces. So identifying indoor air quality issues in the home. Discussion that you would have with your uh, with your contractors. Uh, remember, uh, technicians in the field and installation crews, they are all consultants. Whether they like it or not, people are going to ask them their opinion as to what they have in their house or what the, what they would suggest as homeowners are there, uh, you know, getting their whatever uh, device fixed, uh, whatever it might be there as the service call or the unit replacement uh, with our heating and air conditioning technicians. They're going to get asked the questions, so they are consultants. And I always just tell those guys, just like, listen, you're walking through the space, you just observe things. Um, you know, the, one of the best ideas is if you happen to notice uh, someone has a room air purifier in the space, just say, hey, I noticed you got the room air purifier over there. Is it, you know, what 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 made you buy that and put that in your in your room? And you might say, oh, my husband has allergies or my kids have asthma and just listen and let them talk, talk and tell their story. And obviously you can, you know, add on to that and say, hey, you know, I might have something that would help you not just do the do the room, but the whole house would you be interested in something like that it's just a simple question that you ask to get the conversation going and just letting them know that you have a, res a resolution for their uh, issues in the space so again walk through the space use your senses if you notice water mold or anything in, in the space uh, condensation on the windows or registers would indicate either an airflow problem or a humidity problem uh, you want to check that out uh, test and monitor for the parameters that you might have suspected uh, based on your observations in the walkthrough. Obviously, we're measuring temperature, humidity, uh, carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, particulates. Um, is there dogs in the space or, you know, any sort of hobby that might cause some things to go on? And then don't forget, you can use an air sampling device or monitor uh, to help you take a snapshot of the air and then report back to the homeowner what's going on in their space. And then obviously educate them on the solutions or treatment strategies that would help them remedy what might be going on in that space. So in summary, here's what I would suggest. 
uh, memorize a couple of indoor air quality facts. Remember, um, remember the easy one is we spend about 90% of our time indoors throughout the course of our life. You know, 50 million people are affected by um, uh, allergies or respiratory illnesses. Uh, another 16 million people might have COPD. Uh, just remember, pick a few, just remember those when you're to, to have in your back pocket for conversations with homeowners uh, or contractors. Um, and secondly, memorize the three contaminants when you can. Just remember germs, odors, and particulates equal thirds, just about equal thirds. Remember GOP if you want to, it's up to you. Um, and then familiarize yourself with the treatment strategy. So particulates, remember filtration, HEPA, uh, bipolar ionization, which we'll talk about in the next next class. But uh, to get particulates out of the air, to get germs out of the air and on surfaces and odors, it just familiarize yourself with the different approaches that we would have to remedy those uh, contaminants. So this is being recorded. You will get a copy of this in your email box, I think, tomorrow. Um, be sure to attend the next two training sessions. And again, there are purification technologies, ways that we treat those contaminants. And then finally, taking what you learned today and uh, in the purification class. Uh, and then we're going to take it and talk about how to sell this and put it in terms that people understand and to help move more uh, solutions for those uh particular indoor air quality issues. And again, you can register for those uh, at kggconsulting.com forward slash events. There's my contact info. I think most of you have my email address already. There is my mobile phone number. Uh, I am glad to take any questions along the way, even after today. If you think of something, shoot me a, shoot me a text or uh, email or call me. It doesn't matter. I'm here for you guys. And finally, if you have any questions, now would be the time. Uh, down in the little chat box in the control panel is where you want to enter those, and I'll give you guys a few minutes. I want to thank you and take this time to thank you for spending the time here this morning with me, and hopefully you got something out of this, and I look forward to seeing you in the next sessions.